Westminster Reimagined is back, a special series that looks at how politics works and how we can make it better. Over the next five weeks, we'll be joined by a very special guest host. He's a legendary writer, political satirist, broadcaster, director and creator of brilliant TV comedies, including a particular favourite among our podcast listeners, the thick of it, Armando Anucci. Hi, Armando. Great to have you back on the podcast. Hi. Yes, it's it's good to be back. Um, we did four episodes in season one, trying to get to grips with politics and how we can improve what isn't working. And doing just four was absurd, really. So we're going to see if we can do it uh, with five this time. <laughs> just up by one. Yeah. Yeah. It was quite a lot. To, it. <laughs> quite a lot to tackle. And of course, last season we looked at certain issues including one episode on the issue of accountability or lack thereof in politics and in the past six months since we were last together quite a lot has happened I'm wondering just briefly what you've made with the past yes, six I months. Yes I think we did our first uh, podcast the week that Matt Hancock resigned because he'd breached uh, the guidelines in distancing and that seems like a sort of giddy golden age of decorum given what's happened ever since uh, we've had the whole of Partygate. We've had the, well, actually, started by the Owen Pat- Patterson uh, being found to have breached guidelines and the result being that the government just tried to train, change the rules rather than enact any kind of um, penalty on his behaviour. Um, that then resulted him resigning, a by-election which the government lost. We've had the ongoing COVID situation the emergence of party gate, which I'll, I'll return to in a second, and of course we 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 um, we talk in the middle of a, a major international, the biggest international crisis to hit us since the Second World War. So clearly, season one didn't sort things out. Party gate for me was it's interesting why that seems to have touched a nerve. I think it's not just because the events portrayed in it occurred at a time when we were all trying to do our best to abide by the rules, you know, for the, for a common good. But I think the the insight it gave us into what was actually going on in Downing Street. So all through it, I kept asking myself, you know, is this normal? It's not just the breaching of the guidelines. It's the drinking all day and every day. You know, is this normal? And therefore asking myself the bigger question, you know, is this the politics that we deserve? Is this is this is this normal or is this atypical? So I think this season we shall start, you know, pulling apart little aspects of democracy and parliamentary behaviour and how White Hull works and just holding up to light and seeing whether or not they can be improved. So, Armando, shall we get on with today's episode? I think nothing should stop us. In our first episode of Westminster Reimagined, we'll be joined by Professor of Anthropology at SOAS, University of London, Emma Crew, and MP for the Scottish National Party, Annam Kazar, to discuss if government and Westminster works. We'll unpack the argument that this is how things have always worked and ask, is there another way of doing things? I'm particularly keen to, to, to look at the institution of Parliament, really. I've always been struck by how, and this may just be me, how unuser-friendly the building is. Westminster, to the outsider, looks like a building that says, this is not for the likes of you, please stand away. Whereas I remember going to the Scottish Parliament for the first time and being amazed by how open it felt that how it was actually a welcoming building that is there for the community the city and the country around it and I just wonder whether now is the time to ask ask ourselves you know what it is is it about Westminster that leads to the sort of problems I was mentioning in the introduction party gate and uh, and so on Mm, I'm really excited to to hear from both of them because I spend all day every day thinking about this about right. um, about sort of what politicians are like. Are we getting the best ones that we could? Um, are there are there things embedded in in these structures that just mean that we don't get the kind of policy making and decision making that we really deserve? So I think it's going to be nice to have space to just discuss that for yes, a bit absolutely. with a new MP and um, with someone who's been observing it for a while. So um, without further further ado. Um, Anna and Emma, thank you both so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. Emma Crewe is a professor of anthropology based at SOAS University of London, working on politics, governance 
and identity in Parliament, her ethnographic studies of the House of Lords and the House of Commons were the first on the UK Parliament, and she spent years embedded in both the Lords and the Commons, enjoying uniquely privileged access to the inner workings of the legislature. And her latest book, An Anthropology of Parliaments, Entanglements in Democratic Politics, was published last year. And Annam Kesar is the SNP MP for Airdrie and Shots in Scotland and Scotland's second female Muslim MP. Before becoming an MP, she was a modern studies teacher. After her victory, she pledged to be a role model for other minorities and to fight for Scottish independence. In her maiden speech, she complained that the House of Commons was more rowdy than her former pupils and has questioned the value of the House of Lords as an unelected, crony-stuffed second chamber. Well, welcome, Anna and Emma. Uh, and thank you so much uh, for joining us. Thank you so much. <laughs> so um, to just get started, Anna, you um, were very recently elected and you were also elected in a by-election. I'm just wondering... If you could just tell us first before, you know, to, to get us um, started, what that was like arriving in Parliament, having just been elected. It was a strange experience. I got elected in the early hours of Friday morning. When you get elected, they just hand you an envelope to, and it says, to the new MP. I opened it up and said, right, OK, you're going to get contacted tomorrow morning. Make sure you're free and we'll sort out your travel. You're getting sworn in on Monday. And this was the early hours of Friday morning. I still had to contact my school and speak to them and say, obviously they knew I was running in an election, and say, well, look, heads up, I'm, I'm not going to be in school today. And um, no, it's been an absolute whirlwind um, since my election. And it's not even been a year. And I feel that there's been a lot that I have learned about this new place. That does I, it I, I've heard that for... Uh, people elected on a by-election, it's particularly hard because you're not elected at the same time as a whole new group of, of people, so that you're almost like turning up at school halfway through term as the new person, not knowing anyone. And that's really funny that you use that phrase because as a former teacher, that's exactly how I've explained it to people. Mm -hmm. When you start the new school year and you've got your friends, but someone turns up halfway through and they're trying to learn it. And the thing with Westminster is that the, the language is so different to the language that we use in our normal day-to-day -day sentences. That, that's something new that I've had to learn in the parliamentary procedure. It's something that I've had to learn. And if you come in with a cohort of people, you're all learning together. Mm -hmm. But for me, it's been a process of, of trial and error, to be honest. And what was like first day? What's first day like? Oh, so it was an absolute whirlwind. I, I turned up in the morning. They said, OK, we're going to give you a tour. And of course, I've barely had any sleep. So they're showing me this huge place with loads of corridors and every corridor looks the same. And they went, oh, and this is this room, and this is this room, and I, I wasn't taking any of it in. And then they said, right, okay, now you're going to go get sworn in. I had a couple of practice runs at that, make sure I didn't um, say anything incorrectly. And, um, and then I got told, yeah, you're making your maiden speech on Wednesday. And then I got thrown onto a, the Health and Social Care Committee and done my very first committee appearance with Dominic Cummings the week after. So I have definitely been thrown into the deep end since my election. And uh, did, did you find it user friendly? No. Okay. Um, I would say that the. <laughs> 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 um, and I can expand on that oh, yeah, for please you. Please do, yeah. <laughs> so the language that is used in Parliament is not the language that we use in our day to day mm. basis. So if I stand up in the chamber and I want to refer to someone, I have to call them the honourable member for whatever their constituency is. Um, but even at that, when bills are printed or when you're looking at committee papers, so much of the language is, is it's like a special club, right? And if you've been brought up with that language around you, you're part of that special club. But if you've not been brought up with that language around you, it can be difficult to navigate and break into. But then equally, even just general parliamentary procedures, right? Because I thought you'd have a debate and you go in and you speak in that debate. But no, 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 you've got government debate, you've got opposition day debates, you've got adjournment debates, you've got Westminster Hall debates. But even Westminster Hall debates, there's different types of debates. And... Whilst the language is broadly similar, each debate has different rules in them. Right. And you have to know what the rules are when you go in. And so, for example, you go in, and if you don't bob, then you might not get taken. But you have to know that in order to participate. But if you have to know that, does somebody tell you? Or is it left to you to work it out for yourself? 
So I'm, I'm quite lucky that I've got a really supportive group right. and I've been speaking to a lot of my SNP colleagues and they're keeping me right. But the stark reality is, is that, I mean, you have some books that you can read in parliamentary procedure, but a lot of it, of it is going into the chamber, watching the mannerisms of other people, what they do when they stand up and then just picking up from that. So does that, I'm just bringing you in, Emma, is that, is that your experience watching like whole years or, or uh, whole um, groups of, of MPs on elections? I have noticed that the experience is very different for different MPs. Mm -hmm. So I'm interested in what it's like to be part of a small party because I think that can be very supportive. You get to know the whole group quite well, but then you also have quite a lot of pressure on you because you've got to speak all the time because you've got to be a specialist quite quickly. Whereas, you know, if you're part of a really big party, you're not necessarily going to get on the front bench for years. So I think the experience is very different if you, depending on the, your party, it's very different if your constituency, your constituency is far, isn't it, from, from London. So that creates a lot of pressure. Um, so, you know, if your constituency is down the road, that's a lot easier. But going back to the, the, to the building itself, I have found that people react very differently to the building. So if you've gone to a boarding school, a public boarding school, or if you've gone to Oxford or Cambridge University, even the, the kind of Gothic building is a bit more familiar. It's less, it's less strange. Um, and, and equally, you know, the, the extraordinary number of rules um, and the formality of the rules and the reprimands when you break them. So I remember when I went into the House of Lords the first time, I was absolutely terrified, even though actually... I come from a relatively privileged background, but nonetheless, I was particularly frightened of the doorkeepers and they were mm -hmm. always telling me off for being in the wrong place, for wearing brown shoes on a Friday, for talking to the wrong person at the wrong time, for getting in the way of an important person because I was constantly trying to chat to people because anthropologists like. So how can you break out? Because you, Anna, you were saying that you, you have to kind of, it, it's left to yourself to try and work it out and try and follow follow the rules from what other people are doing and then see if you can fit in. But there must be also an urge to to not fit in in terms of not want to have to conform to these rules and regulations that have been around for centuries. So, I mean, I am relatively young. I'm a woman. I am of colour and I have a strong Scottish accent. So I think I already stick up, stick out like a, a sore thumb. And um, part of it is wanting to, to stick out and not conform. But part of it is I have an important job to do. I have been elected by the people of Airdrie and Shots. And it's my responsibility to go into the chamber and speak on their behalf and lobby on their behalf on the issues that they're contacting me about. So there definitely is a balance. Um, and also, in terms of the support that, that's there at Parliament, one thing I think is really important and it's not spoken about is how great the House staff are. Mm -hmm. And actually, even though I am an SNP MP and we really regularly make jokes about independence and how I don't want to be there. Actually, the Speaker's Office, for example, are so supportive. And if at any time I've had to go in and been like, look, well, for example, last night I had my very first adjournment debate and I had to learn the processes because it's slightly different. You don't have to say certain things or you do have to say certain things and you only have a certain amount of time. But I went up and spoke to them and they were like, well, this is what you do, this is what you don't do. So there are people there to keep you right and like the house staff are great. But at the absolute heart of it, it does feel like if you're not part of this club, if you don't know the rules and the mannerisms, then it's difficult to to become embedded in that. Not that I necessarily want to. What did you find? Did you find that people in the end is it is it just easier to try and follow the rules than than to try and carve out a, a niche as someone who's slightly, um, you know, a, slightly outside that 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 set of kind of conformity. Well, the, actually, the rules are changing all the time. So this idea of a kind of fossilized parliament is an exaggeration. So the rules of procedure are constantly under review. There's a procedure committee in both the two houses, and uh, they're, they're constantly looking at whether or not to stay, change the standing orders or... I would disagree, Emma. I don't think parliament is changing, and I think there's a reluctance to change. So when I was elected, we had a hybrid parliament, and we had... Um, chamber via zoom you could apply to speak 
And it was a choice, and this is the really important point, point, it was a choice to go back to the normal way that we've done things. During hybrid, MPs, as I understand, before I was elected, they voted on their phones, and then it changed to proxy voting, but it was a change to to go back to traipsing through a lobby. And I do not understand, pandemic or no pandemic, I don't understand how that's a viable use of MPs' time, traipsing through a lobby. And a specific point I want to bring up is one of my colleagues. So Amy Callahan is the SNP MP for Eastern Bartonshire. She has this amazing story to tell of getting through teenage cancer and uh, while she was elected, suffered a brain hemorrhage and she has spoken repeatedly and I've spoken in the chamber and said, well, look, you're not going to change everything, but at the very least, give people who who require medical grounds to have proxy voting, give that to them. But till today, Amy is still having to go against doctors' orders in order to vote at Parliament. So, yes, there's some changes, but I would say they're happening at a very, very slow level and not fast enough. I agree. And I think it is harder to change things if you're in the smaller parties. So, for example, it is MPs in the two big parties who want to keep voting in the lobbies, not electronic voting, because it's when they can talk to their their front benches and influence them. And even if, you know, if their party is in government, then they can even get access to the ministers and the prime minister. And I mean, I remember stories of uh, some ministers during the Labour government having kind of post-its, like a kind of Greek wedding, you know, with all the pound notes or, or whatever, uh, Greek equivalent, all over their jackets um, or dresses, because there are endless MPs asking them to pay attention to particular problems that have often been raised by their constituents. But that doesn't necessarily work for many MPs. I absolutely agree with you. But I think the importance of recognizing that change does happen gives one some hope and some incentive for trying to change things. Because it's easy otherwise, I think, to kind of fall into a state of despair and just think, well, you know, the building looks old and it is extremely unfriendly and it is very difficult to change things. But it's not... It's not the officials, it's it's the MPs themselves who are often very conservative with the little C and and cling on to the way things are done because it suits some people. It suits some people. And is there a familiarity as well? Is it just some people settle into that kind of groove and think, you know, this, you know, I can, I can keep this up for some time and, you know, I, I, I can get used to this. I think that's true. I mean, with it's interesting um, looking at the restoration and renewal program. So it's very expensive to stay in the building while it's being renovated. And and I think people tend to assume, oh God, politicians are just so tradition bound, they won't move. But I've got a theory that life is so chaotic as a politician and so pressured and so kind of increasingly fragmented that the building itself is one of the few continuities in your life. So I think politicians are shapeshifters because you've got, you know, you're talking to a constituent one minute, you're talking to a journalist the next minute. You've got to continually adapt to these different audiences. But the 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 building is like a rock; it stays there. And I think it it's actually quite nerve wracking for people to think that they might be moved out of this extraordinary building. And you know, where's their rock? Right. Where's their sense of continuity? Well, I suppose my question for you, Emma, and and then kind of for you, Anna, as well is whether this affects the kind of laws that get made or the quality of our policy making, that whether these things that we've been talking about mean that MPs do their jobs less well. Do you sort of, because I suppose it actually doesn't matter to, you know, or it only matters to a small degree if people feel personally uncomfortable doing the job, but they're still able to be effective politicians. Like, Annam, I don't know what your experience is of that, but you come up against these challenges, but ultimately you don't feel like they're an obstacle to achieving what you want to achieve from the role. Um, do you think that it is actually harming the standard of politics that we get? I'm looking forward to the possibility we might disagree about this mm -hmm. because um, I actually think that it is really important that we have a stronger respect for the rule of law and a kind of the rule of rule, if you like, the, the procedural rules than the current uh, administration. So actually, I think we've seen really, really a worrying kind of, I don't know if you could even call it a kind of ethical collapse in the, in the recent years. 
when I was in bed in I've the I've called hospital. it an ethical rot. So, uh, oh, okay. Yes. Yeah, I, I suppose <laughs> I I'm an academic. ethical so. and some kind of um, yeah. destruction. Yeah, in, yeah, exactly. <laughs> when I was watching Parliament, it was much more kind of orderly. Mm. And actually, I had huge respect for that because... You know, politics is about the fact that we're all very diverse. We have these huge disagreements. We have conflicts of interests. And we need to have ritual, funnily enough. I mean, people don't generally think of it like that, but I'm an anthropologist, so I guess I would. But in the ritual, you have these rules, and actually you need people to stick to them. You need politicians and the speaker to take those rules incredibly seriously. Um, so you change them with great care. You definitely do need to change them. But I would like... Uh, a kind of respect for rules, but a far, far more progressive attitude towards the emergencies that are facing us in society. So, you know, let's be really, really radical about the fact that we've got climate breakdown and we've got a mental health crisis. You bring those massive subjects up, and I just wonder whether we have a, a, the parliamentary system is adaptable enough to move quickly on, on things like that, or, or whether because of the rules and the procedures, actually, you know, the chances of you to make a sudden change immediately is, is is very hard well funnily enough i was talking about this with some people from number 10 yesterday oh, thank you. they were saying that you know that parliament managed to pass something like 11 bills in a day mm -hmm. at the outbreak of world war ii that there's always been within the system the possibility to be agile and to adapt and they haven't been as agile recently with COVID, even though they were a bit quicker but actually kind of within the flexibility of the constitution you kind of can adapt to, to crises. So I wonder why that's yeah. happened then, that that, yeah. that, that, that think the pace has slowed down, that there is a kind of, it seems that it, it seems to be sludgier th than it was. I suppose just um, like one step back, I'm really interested, because we have a, a new MP in our midst, I'm really interested in, just because we were talking about how there are aspects of the current system that can feel unwelcoming, how it's felt for you, Annam, if you feel like, those are difficult, but you can still do your job? Or have there been moments where actually you feel less able to be an effective politician because of aspects of this place being unwelcoming? Yeah, so I've actually had uh, an experience quite recently that kind of follows that. So I am a young woman of colour. In fact, from Scotland, I'm the only MP of colour. And, you know, I am there to represent my constituents of Airdrie and Shots, but I do feel this slight pressure that I'm there also to represent the different demographics that look or talk like me. And I go into Parliament and I wear my Western and inverted comma clothes on a near daily basis. And just a couple of weeks ago, I went into Parliament and wore a shalvar kameez, so it's a traditional Pakistani dress. And I wear my pass and I've got it in my hand. And while I'm wearing Western and inverted comma clothes, I don't get stopped. But on this one day, whilst I had Shalvar Kameez, twice in one day by two different sets of met Metropolitan Police, I was stopped and asked to show my ID. The first time, I just pushed it to a side mm -hmm. and went on with my day. But the second time, it was at the exact same location between Central Lobby and the Chamber. The second time, so I was this like, was inside the building? This was inside right. the building, between Central Lobby and the Chamber. Yeah. And the second time, I turned around, I was like, no, this is, this is now a recurring mm -hmm. Theme in one day by two different sets of Met Police, and I walked through to the to the other side, and there was doorkeepers there, and I'm very strong. I would like to think I've dealt with a, a number of different uh, racial abuse cases throughout my life, but at that point, I just felt so alienated because I do look a little bit different to most MPs out there, and that in itself is alienating. But to be stopped by the police twice in one day and asked to show my idea, ID just further perpetuates that stereotype of I don't look like a politician and I don't belong there. Now, after that, I got really upset and I was with doorkeepers and um, I'll be honest, I started crying because I shouldn't be made to feel like that in my workplace. And I've raised it with the speaker and the police and they've been very supportive of me. But the stark reality is, is that still that notion and idea is if you're not the stereotype of a politician that you do not 
belong there. That is so troubling. And just to explain to people, you would have had an MP's pass, wouldn't you, which is very recognisable. Yeah, so the the MP pass and the lanyard, you can tell a mile off that I am an MP. To be fair, I did have it in my hand. Um, But still, the fact that there was nothing different, Emma, to any other day. It was just that my clothes looked a little bit different, so I looked more ethnic, in inverted commas. Sadly, I've heard stories like this of of even people being challenged by politicians, by other politicians, and saying, uh, sorry, this is an an MP's lift, for example, so you'll have to leave. Yeah, that happened to me. Oh, no. Oh, yeah, it was by by another (laughs) MP. (laughs) Oh, I know. It's not even a year. I was going into the members' cloakroom to get my shoes. Um, So I wear shoes, and then I've got my trainers when I'm leaving Parliament because, you know, I'm not wearing heels outside. And I was going in to change over my shoes and I was going down the member staircase talking to a, an MP from a different political party we go before the cloakroom and he just looks at me and points to the sign on the door that says this is for MPs only and I was like okay I, I won't use the words that no, no. I won't use the words that I did use at that point. Well, it would be like, unparlamentary. Well, it would <laughs> be unparlamentary. <laughs> that wouldn't stop me. Um, just indicates further that if you don't look like an MP that you're going to be challenged by security, by other MPs, and it's it's difficult. And I wonder also whether there's a sense of, perhaps Emma, you can pick up on this, there is a sense of some people, it's like imposter syndrome, which is a lot of people arriving there thinking, what am I doing here? Why, how did I get here? And and if, if you are, you know, especially in your early days there, confronted with rules and legislations that, that seem to be stopping you, whether you get you whether it's, there's a danger you get swallowed up by it. I think imposter syndrome is incredibly common, but it's also quite uneven. And in a way, if you think of Parliament as a microcosm of society, then the the inequalities you see in society show up in Parliament in a way in a magnified form because there's so much competition between people. So I think imposter syndrome often is more acute if you're somebody who's faced inequality in life generally, or if you, for example, if you've been the victim of racism, this is extremely undermining, isn't it? You know, we're all trying to kind of feel confident, but that kind of onslaught on your identity is is really, really hard. And, and you even get it in the House of Lords, which is kind of a courtly place, but I was told by people in this um, house where, you know, there's a sort of ethos of being very egalitarian, not with the rest of society, obviously, but between the peers. Um, but then when people would rank each other and kind of judge each other and talk about who was who was good at performing in the chamber, mm-hmm. when they weren't, I noticed that sometimes gender or race would come into the explanation if you were a person of color or if you were, if you were a woman, like they'd say, oh, yeah, she sounds like a fishwife or, well, he, yeah, he's black, he's, he's chippy or something like that. So I think racism takes many forms, doesn't it? And people assume it's simple. It's actually really complex. No, I completely agree. Gone are the days when someone would outwardly just make a racist remark towards you. It can feel so institutionalised. And it goes back to, Armando, what you were talking about, is that idea of imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. And actually, if you do look a little bit different in comparison to all of your colleagues, then you really are thinking... Not just do I belong here, but do I deserve to be here? Am I good enough to and be also, here? And also, are they accepting me here? Exactly. And are, are they accepting the fact that actually mm. I was elected and I have mm. as much right to be here as they do? Did you feel confident that, because you, you, meant, you said you mentioned it to the Speaker, did you feel confident that there was a sort of system in place where that kind of um, uh, uh, experience that you had could could be dealt with? Or do you feel that it's, you know... Your words have just gone into a big pool of (laughs) never to be dealt with again. So, look, I'm the first person to complain in the chamber if I feel like the speaker's not called me and he's being unfair. But at at this point, I have to say that um, Lindsay was was great. He was very, very supportive of me. And I said to them, well, look, what I don't want is for you guys to do some sort of diversity training and a tick box exercise and pat yourself on the back because that's not how this can work and I'm not going to allow you to work it like this and they were very very open to that and they've said that they'll they'll investigate and have those discussions so I do feel supported from the speaker which is really important. Do you think parliament should do more about the online abuse that you get because I I was reading the other day that 
people of color get 165% more online hate. Uh, I think it was on Twitter, but it could have been on, it could have been other platforms as well. Do you think that's kind of a responsibility of parliament or do you think it's for all of us to deal with or? So that's a really interesting point because I, <laughs> looking at my Twitter not- notifications sometimes, it's just very, very sad. Um, but there's lots of layers to it and it's, it's more complex than just saying it's racism because part of it is I'm an SNP MP and I want independence for Scotland. So there's that aspect of it. There's the aspect of it that I'm young. There's the aspect of it that I look particularly young. I look younger than I am. There's the aspect that I'm a woman. There's the aspect that I'm off colour. And I think this racism and misogyny and ageism all just blends in together. Now, this is something that I've raised in the chamber. It was um, back before summer recess. Do you remember the Black England players received a ton of horrific mm-hmm. abuse mm-hmm. online? And I stood up and said, well, look, this is not something new. If I look at my Twitter notifications, I regularly get told to go back home, which makes no sense because I was born in Edinburgh. I am home. Scotland's my home. But I spoke about this and said, well, look, the government needs to take some responsibility as well. And they do have the online harms bill coming through, but... This has to be strengthened and it's not just for me, it's people from all different positions who are especially out of colour or are women um, all across the spectrum, not just in politics. I'm really interested in another pressure that I think you have to deal with um, where, again, going back to the fact that we've got these inequalities in society, uh, which you would have had personal experience of. So when you're representing your constituency... How do you handle the difficulty of like, where you focus at any time? Where, who do you prioritise? Who do you talk to? And, and how does it relate to how you may feel that other people, say, in Scotland, maybe who are people of colour or are young people or whatever, it, or people who share your identity, they may be claiming your time and attention as well. So how on earth do you deal with all this? multitude of voices. First and foremost, I'm elected as the Member of Parliament for Airdrie and Shots. And I think we need to have a wider discussion about what the role of an MP actually is. Is it voting? Is it debating? Is it being in the constituency? I'm not convinced that we spend enough time in our constituencies. I think far too much time is spent wasted in Westminster. But um, on that, yeah, you're right, I wear different hats and so often I get contacted by people. I mean, I have had a lovely email just after I got elected from one of my former pupils who said, Miss, I watched your maiden speech with my little sister who's seven years old and we just got so emotional because for her at seven years old to see another woman of colour being elected was just so, it's so different to the norm and thank you so much. And I got really emotional because I'm one of my former pupils. But even last week, I um, wrote this wee card to a, a girl called, also called Adam, um, who's seven years old um, because she got in contact with me saying, you look like me. Like that, that, and at seven years old, she's able to identify that actually I'm someone in politics. And I mean, I will not be the first one to jump to the defence of a conservative, but actually, there's a couple of people that have inspired me in my life. And I'd say one of them was Mohammed Sarver, who, of course, was the first Pakistani Muslim MP to be elected, but also Saida Warsi, so Baroness Warsi was the first Muslim in cabinet. And I remember that iconic picture of her outside 10 Downing Street winning a shalwar kameez. And I was in my teens. I had gone through 9-11. We'd gone through the Iraq war. But I still saw someone that looked like me. And I think that is such a powerful tool because not the, the population is, is majority women. And we've got an increase in number of people of colour. And if politics doesn't represent the people, then what are we doing? I want to go back to uh, what I said at the start, the the fact when I went around the Scottish Parliament, realising how kind of much more open it felt in terms of its kind of ambience. And it may be because we had to start with scr- from scratch with the Scottish Parliament and indeed the Welsh Assembly. You know, that was something that, that was, is was built from nothing and is part of the problem that Westminster has been around for centuries now and it's very difficult to switch it off and and start it afresh 
you know, you've got this building that's ancient. I'm, I sort of hope they do move for the refurbishment because it might just. I did like that, like you. I I did think that through the COVID period when everything went on Zoom and you could vote remotely and so on, that that would be something that stayed because it felt so. Not revolutionary, just just contemporary, really. It makes sense, <laughs> it felt, though. That's the thing. It felt so normal. It makes sense. It, it seemed weird to step back yeah. from from the normal. I'm torn between uh, agreeing with you on the one hand, but also on the other hand, it is really difficult to sh to shrug off the attachment to that building that one can develop. And so another alternative is to look more at what you were talking about, Anon, which is so how do MPs. Uh, relate to people within their constituency and also to other people who they are in touch with because they get very passionate or they're building on their existing yeah. expertise in education or whatever it is. But also look at what the select committees are doing. So the select committees came from nowhere. You know, they've yeah. only been existing for 40 years and they've already doing outreach, doing, doing really amazing consultation with children in the case of the Select Committee on Education, for example. So they go around the country, they go, they go even overseas, and a lot of that we don't see. So I followed a little bit of law, for example. Um, so most political scientists and legal scholars will look at huge tranches of, of legislation to try and figure out what's going on. But I, I did the opposite, I went for depth. So I followed 250 words for two years, and I literally observed and, and observed thousands of people talk to, to a few hundred. And one of the things that was fascinating was that civil society organizations had a massive impact, but it didn't show up in the text. So if you look at the text, the final amendment was made by this amazing peer, Baroness Butler Sloss, who's like, you know, president of the family court. And it was her amendment, but behind that, um, it was actually drafted by a, a paralegal in a children's charity in central London. And, and these civil society organizations and children's charities were in touch with, with the parties in both houses, uh, working beavering away, in, in, and we just don't see that. So there's yes, a lot that yes. goes on behind the scenes. So I think that's a really interesting point. I sit on the Women and Equalities Committee and we're doing some really interesting work right now. We've got an inquiry on workplace and the menopause, um, equality in the asylum process. We're looking at preventing violence against women and girls. Some really, really interesting, important points. But at the absolute heart of it, right, I would go back to what is the job of an MP and what is it that my constituents want from me? My constituents want me to vote. They want me to debate, yes, but ultimately they want me in the constituency speaking to them. Last week I had a cost of living surgery in ASDA, right? I was there for an hour and it was back to back. People knew because I'd advertised it, but people also just, as they were doing their shopping, they just dropped by and saw my big big poster and said, all right, well, you're the MP. Can we sit and speak to you about X, Y, and Z? That hour of my time, I picked up casework on health, social work, cost of living. And I genuinely do feel as if that one hour out in ASDA was a better use of my time than an hour traipsing through the mm -hmm. lobbies. And I totally understand why people who have been there for years say, oh, well, this is a great opportunity for me to speak to the minister and get a word in with the prime minister. But I feel as if my better use of time is actually being in the constituency and speaking to folks. As you were saying, Emma, it's different if you're in one of the larger parties and also particularly the party that's in power because then isn't a lot, aren't a lot of backbenchers kind of split. If they, if they are of a younger generation, are they tempted to calculate whether they should be spending time in their constituency or whether they should be actually putting themselves about in order to be noticed and and get promotion and get a job in government and get 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 higher office? I think it's a really interesting point and I take great joy in watching some of the Conservative MPs to see how they interact okay, in committees. <laughs> I just think it fascinating in watching them interact in committees with one another and with other parliamentarians. Mm -hmm. I've been there for less than a year and you can quite quickly tell which ones when to be noticed in order to get promotion. Again, it goes back to the heart of what's the role of an MP. And there's a big debate, as you say, about, I mean, some people think that more time spent with constituents is the role of the, is sort of trespassing on the role of the, of the councillors and that this is just glorified social work. I don't agree. I absolutely agree with you, Anna. I actually think even with the people who are in the big parties, it, it, it brings MPs down to earth. But also as a voter, you want to know that you have some connection to 
to Parliament, don't exactly. you? Exactly. And also, I think even government um, MPs who interact with their constituents uh, understand some of the impact of the legislation they've passed or, or the difficulties with the administration. So I think it's, I think it's a really important role. And, and last thing on, on, on that is there is a pattern that I've noticed whereby the women MPs feel much more comfortable when it gets really distressing. So I've witnessed a lot of surgery meetings and they're often very, very complex issues. Mental illness shows up to a staggering degree. And it, it, there is an interesting pattern. I mean, it's not very surprising because women are socialized. We're kind of socialized to listen and we find that kind of emotional turbulence, I think, uh, kind of a little bit easier. So the only, me the only MPs I found who delegated it almost all to caseworkers was, was a few blokes. Nearly all MPs do some, but it, there's some interesting patterns there that I think really worth looking at. We're, we're going to have to wrap up in a second. So I'm wondering to, to, pull, I know, so to pull you both back <laughs> um, for just one final thought. We've talked a bit about, you know, things that don't go so well in Parliament. Mm -hmm. And I've just be, it'd be nice to end on maybe just one brief thought from both of you on a small change that could be made that would make our politics a tiny bit better you from experience and you from all of your experience observing many many politicians and would you like to go first politics should be kinder of course but i think to help us do our jobs as members of parliament is to actually have an open and frank conversation in about tradition and how much of that is important in 2022 and yes you can respect the tradition of how parliament has run over all these years but the hybrid system showed us that MPs can vote on their phones or have proxy votes and they can speak online. When President Zelensky came and addressed us overnight they introduced TVs in the chamber. It's completely possible, it's a political choice to not make it more accessible and I think if we had that change it would better our politics and open the potential of having more different people who look a little bit different becoming elected. I completely agree with that and I would add as the second priority to develop a much more sophisticated approach to knowledge and how it's handled. So I don't think we live in a post-truth world. I, live, I think we live in a world which is totally confused about knowledge and I think we all need to have a really, really good look at, at how we value knowledge. So the, the knowledge of lawyers and, and scientists is kind of venerated. But actually, we are beginning to take personal testimony a bit more seriously, for example. But what doesn't happen enough in government, but also in parliament, including even in select committees, and they're the real experts in dealing with knowledge, uh, and even in constituencies, I think we all need to think much harder about how knowledge is produced, how it circulates, how it gets twisted and distorted, when it's being used for, for political gain and when it's people genuinely trying to inquire into what on earth is going on. We need to have a little bit of uh, tolerance for the fact that there is inevitable political spin, but we need to be totally unforgiving when politicians knowingly lie and pretend they're not. So I think we really need to have a good think about knowledge. I think that's a, a good, a tough note to end it on. Yes. <laughs> Thank you both very much. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. That was such a good conversation. Thank you. So, Armando, that was a really interesting chat. Do you feel like we got to the bottom of it? It certainly touched on various things that I thought, yes, why don't we do that? Like the, you know, bringing in the screens. The idea of the use of knowledge, I mean, it connects with the screens because actually Parliament could benefit from the witness and advice of many, many people outside Parliament. We see on our screens the uh, the American select committees when they hold the leaders of such and such Facebook up and quiz them. And I know we get that in the select committees. But actually, if we felt, OK, if we can't bring the build, if we can't make the building more accessible, can we make the idea of Parliament more accessible by having more participation from outside? I think we didn't touch on... Um, the rule breaking that does take place in government, the fact that, you know, Parliament sets the rules. But if, a, if an MP breaks rules like Owen Paterson, the idea then is to change the rules to let them off rather than to penalise <laughs> that, that idea. And, and um, I'm sure we could do a whole podcast 
on Partygate alone and, and all the questions it raises. Yeah, and I think the thing I was really struck by was that, I mean, there were lots of things that we looked at, little obstacles to MPs doing their jobs well, mm. but it seemed as though the the main way in which change happens is just by MPs like Annam Kazar taking on quite a lot of personal difficulty to sort of trailblaze for more people like her to come on through. I think, you know, in a way that's a great thing, but also kind of rubbish that there isn't well, a, we, a more systematic We don't want to put people of off from wanting to go into Parliament um, if they uh, find out that quite a lot of your work in Parliament is, is trying to work out how it works, how you fit in, and, and being able to kind of get round those obstacles. So that's it for now. I'll be back next week with Armando for our second episode. I'm really looking forward to it. Until then, thank you for joining us on the New Statesman podcast. Goodbye. Goodbye.